our study. Father, thank you for this house of worship you have provided for Grace Bible Church to gather time and again to uh, gather for Bible study, for prayer, for worship of our triune God. What a privilege is ours that uh, even in the blustery weather out there, we could come to this warm place uh, that you provided. Um, would you captivate our hearts with your truth tonight, uh, giving us a, a rich theology of your word that we might uh, live our lives in light of? We'll be cautious to give you all the praise in your name. Amen. I would remind you that uh, Wednesday is a, a bit less formal, and so uh, occasionally there may be uh, a question that's percolating that you just can't wait till we shut off the recording and whatnot. And, uh, you know, I'd, I'd like to regularly, I probably don't say it enough, you know, and if you've got a question that uh, you're going to forget about or uh, not going to make sense later, uh, I, I would uh, uh, be interested in engaging those. We want to make sure that uh, the truth is clear in your mind. Many times the questions kind of unquestion themselves as the lesson goes on. But uh, um, we began last week looking at a study on bury or burn, a study on cremation. Uh, I'm not looking for things to do. I told you that last week. Just trying to respond providentially to shepherding opportunities that God provided here in our congregation. A question was asked months ago when we had three families affected by death. And I thought I was going to give a quick one-week lesson. And uh, as I got into study last week, uh, one week turns into two. And I'm done telling you when I think I'm going to be done because I don't think part two is the end either. So... Uh, I'm not a prophet or the son of a prophet. Uh, we're going to have some rich time in the Word, thinking theologically about this issue. Does the Bible make a big deal of burial over burning? Uh, I think we've introduced the subject enough last week to understand there may be more there than meets the eye. Before 1930 in the U.S., Cremation was considered bizarre. In 1996, about 22% of the dead in the U.S. were cremated, and then it had been estimated that by 2010, it would grow to nearly 40%. Much more recently, it was expected to rise from, get this, 1.91 million in 2022 to 2.26 million by the year 30. That's just seven years away. Uh, by the way, the percentage back last year, uh, or actually uh, two years ago, now that we are 2023, uh, in 2021, the percentage of those that were cremated was 57.5% in this country of ours where it used to be bizarre to even consider cremation. I think we can... See, the data speak for itself that many no longer see cremation as unusual. I told you that I flip-flopped through the years and I have totally landed different than where I was in the early years of ministry because of the privilege I have as a pastor to sit and study and realize, you know what, I, uh, I need to be more convictional about this. And um, what accounts for this change? Among many Christians, it probably reflects a lack of knowledge about how strongly the early Christians believed in rejecting the custom, which includes a biblical perspective on the normative nature of burial and the practical implications of the doctrine of resurrection, the value and honor of the human body, and a biblical picture of fire and judgment. I know that my experience is not everyone's. But as one who was raised in a nominal Bible church, I had a lot of catch-up to do, even in Bible college, on a biblical and systematic theology, even on church history. Our churches just aren't teaching the stuff that we need to be teaching. Biblical theology, systematic theology, even church history, there's a wealth to be gained in our study of each of them. Think of the average church. 
It's the permissive posture of our day, whichever way you want to go out. After you die, if you want to be buried or if you want to be cremated and burned up, it doesn't really matter a whole hill of beans. Well, the Roman Catholic Church, which we are not, we are Protestants. But the Roman Catholic Church once strongly condemned cremation and in 1963 made an about face regarding not only accepting it, but even producing an order of worship for the practice. Much change has gone on. And add to that the reasoning of geography, where people make cremation an issue of not taking up nearly as much space, issue of economy, it's cheaper route at times, or the environment and family. Yeah, of course, it's cheaper and easier to transport cremated remains than dealing with a body, but is that the best way to go about it? I am not going to go through all of last week to review, just to remind you of some of what you already said last week. Scripture does not command the mode of burial, though it speaks negatively on cremation. So there is no command, no prohibition, and yet the wealth of biblical data is that it's poo-pooed on. It's, it's negative. You only got three instances of it in the Old Testament Scriptures, 1 Samuel 31, Amos 2, and Amos 6. The Old Testament practices from Abraham to David, and I had specified in your notes last week, I gave you a lot more names in between them. They were all buried. Along with the New Testament pattern, John the Baptist, Lazarus, Jesus, Stephen, the practice of the Hebrews and the practice of Christians throughout church history has been that of burial. So we presented the subject last week and we wove through it. And I told you we had to circle back around this week to think through some theology. Theology of the body, theology of resurrection, theology of judgment by fire. Uh, I don't think we're going to get to, actually, uh, I'll tell you, we are not getting to uh, the judgment by fire, and we're not really getting into a theology of resurrection, which is crucial to Christian theology. Just think with me for a few moments on the body. Given a, a lot of recent history, as well as distant history through the years for Christian practice, as well as the Hebrews of burial. We looked at only three instances of all the Old Testament witness of cremation. But since it's not just a cultural or historical issue, but a theological issue, what's the authority for believers? Our Bible. I just happen to be holding up a, a study Bible. As long as we remember that uh, the notes uh, on the bottom of the page of the uninspired uh, section and above it is the inspired Word of God. So let's look at a theology of the body before we get into a theology of resurrection and judgment. As we think through the body and as I I couldn't tell you what's on the screen on the wall behind you, and uh, I don't know how clear this is here, that's why you've got your handouts, but uh, what is a person? Only a body, which is material, or more realistically, a living soul, immaterial? Say you uh, were going off to med school even in the sciences, what they're going to bolster your intellect in is the human body. To go into uh, the medical world, what do doctors do? We can drug you, we can cut you. That's what we do to the body. So, are we just body? Or is there more that meets the eye that is more important than the body? Because here's, here's what uh, one of the benefits of our little study tonight will do. 
we try to encourage brothers or sisters in Christ at a graveside by reminding them to be absent from the body is to what? Be present with the Lord. They're not really there, is what we say. Though their soul is not there, the representation of who we have known them to be is still that body. Integrally affected. Are our bodies separate from ourselves? Something that we have but are not part of who we are? Or are they integral to our identities? That our real person is not just the inner man and our soul, but the body's wrapped up in that identity as well. There are several theological considerations necessary to answer these and a host of other questions. So as always, we open our Bibles. Open your Bibles to Genesis 2-7 if you would. One verse, one pregnant verse, one foundational verse, understanding that the book of beginnings has the beginning of everything. Genesis 2 and verse 7. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. Now stop on that verse for just a moment. God himself created the physical body of the first human in Genesis 2-7, foundational to our theology. Though he's formed from the humble materials of dust, Adam's body was dignified and animated by the breath of life received directly from God. He received his body directly from God and his soul immediately from God. Both material and immaterial parts originated directly from God. Both. You know, most Religious and philosophical systems conclude with a truncated view of humanity. Either all material, all body, or all immaterial, all soul. But the biblical view of mankind is the unity of both. Call it dualism. And again, I told you there's a host of angles, theologically speaking, that we're not going to go. We don't have time to exhaust the subject. We're not going to get into discussion of whether man is a two-part or a three-part. Is he dichotomy or trichotomy debate? That would take us a few hours to uh, banter back and forth. We do know at the bare minimal, man is body and soul. He's material and he is immaterial. And our experience on this planet, we're experiencing things of this body, which breaks and wears out and gets holes in it, this tent of which Paul talks about, and it houses our soul. Since the time God fashioned Eve's body from Adam's side, all human bodies and souls have originated by natural procreation and every human is born in the image of God. This is not, uh, being an image bearer of God is not exclusive to Christian theology or, or uh, theology, it's not exclusive to just believers. All man is created in the image of God. Through natural procreation, you take sperm meeting egg there is life. There is a body that starts growing in the womb, and the soul is there immediately upon conception. You know, I'm stating here the tradi tradition view of where, where does man's soul come from? And this too is not part of our discussion tonight but shortly will be when we start our study of the Pentateuch because uh, we're going to spend a little time in Genesis since that's where we're at tonight. Um, but we'll, we'll circle back around the, the coming weeks here. Notice bullet point number two. Significant is that 
In biblical theology, humans are not first and essentially soul spirit with an appended body. God didn't first create a soul and then place it into a body. You notice how the creation account intentionally reveals a biblical anthropology of man's creation. God created man's body from the dust of the ground. Then he breathed into it the breath of life, and man became a living being. The first man was a body, then became a living being. Thus, the body and soul are not opposed to each other, though they are distinct entities. Our body is not our soul, our soul is not our body, but we experience both realities in this life. Now, Lorraine Bentner, uh, some, many of you have copies of his Reformed Doctrine of Predestination on your shelf. Uh, he was trained at Princeton under that great systematic theologian, uh, Dr. Hodge. Uh, I recently ordered this book, Immortality. Here's his quote, the body is as really and eternally a part of man as is his spirit, and the resurrection of the body is an indispensable part of his salvation, unquote. Or as John Murray phrases it, there are two entities in man's constitution, diverse in nature and origin, the one derived from the earth, material, corporeal, phenomenal, divisible, and the other derived from a distinct action of God, immaterial, and ordinarily not phenomenal, indivisible, and indestructible. These two entities form one organic unit without disharmony or conflict. In the integral person, they are interdependent. They coact and interact. It's a mystery as how the body and soul work together, but we're experiencing both aspects of reality every day, every, every moment of every day that we live. There is that body component, the material, as well as our immaterial soul. So, we view our bodies as gifts from God, as good things to be celebrated and honored, not worshipped not practicing idolatry. Why is uh, there dignity in the human body? Because the body is part of our identity, as the soul is part of our identity, and we are image bearers of God. Where does man derived, uh, derive value? Because we're image bearers of Him. This is against Greek philosophy that viewed the body as a prison of the soul. You know, the body, flesh, that's evil. This is part of Pythagorean as well as Platonic doctrine. In it, death and dissolution of the body provide a means for the soul to be finally emancipated, rescued, get rid of that wicked body. Because what's done in my soul is pure. Fire is what symbolized the purification and release of the soul and the unification of the body with its original elements. You know, this, uh, this shows Yoda to be a bad theologian in his belief. Luminous beings we are, he says, not this crude matter. So, a biblical theology of the body goes against Greek philosophy, also goes against Christian science, which is neither Christian nor science. To quote their esteemed theologian, Mary Baker Eddy, she wrote this, quote, man is not matter. He is not made up of brain, blood, bones, and other material elements. The Scriptures inform us that man is made in the image and likeness of God. Matter is not that likeness. The likeness of spirit cannot be so unlike spirit. 
Man is spiritual and perfect, and because he is spiritual and perfect, he must be so understood in Christian science. Man is idea, the image of love. He is not physique, unquote. I say boo to you, Mary Baker Eddy. Uh, yes, we are soul, we are spiritual creatures, but we are housed in this hunk of flesh for a period of time, however many decades, from our birth date until our death date. It is a dual nature of man. So when we're talking about salvation, oftentimes we're thinking about our soul, nothing to do with the body. But salvation is not just a spiritual matter that relates to the soul, the body being largely irrelevant. Salvation includes the body. Let's think through a little Pauline theology for a moment here. In Romans 8.23, he teaches us that the body will also be redeemed, not just man's soul, but his body. And I see some of you making a flurry to get to your New Testament. So you can uh, race me to 1 Corinthians 6 because that's where we're headed in his theology. From Romans 8.23, in your mind you move to Philippians 3. In our men's Bible study, we have now got up to Philippians 3 coming up this Saturday. We'll probably get through the first 11 verses, Lord willing, this Saturday. Depends on how much you guys talk at me. If you don't talk, I keep on going. In Philippians 3.21, our body will be transformed to be like our Lord's glorious body. So in Pauline theology, redemption is not just an issue of the soul, but one of the body. And this body is going to be redeemed. It's going to be transformed to be like our Lord's glorious body. When Jesus' body... Here's, here's where we're going to end the study tonight. Jesus' body is placed in the grave. And three days later, Jesus' body leaves the grave and appears not as a spirit being, but still as the God-man. He is the God-man forever. Okay, you gave me enough time to get 1 Corinthians 6, right? This is a key passage to our discussion, Okay. I haven't gone over there. I'm too busy talking. In uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, when Paul says you are bought with a price, go to, sorry, different Bible than I usually preach from. Let's go down towards the end of the chapter. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Good question, verse 19. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, verse 20, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your spirit, right? No, in your body. That Verb, bought, you were bought, agorizo, bought with a price. He concludes from this argument that we are therefore to honor God with our body. What's the, uh, what's the carryover? What's the application? Understand their theology that we were bought by Christ. We were redeemed by Christ. We glorify Him in these bodies. Every action of these bodies. The same passage furnishes additional reason for why we respect the body. You know, why do you practice good hygiene? Why do you exercise? You know, there's a theology of the body. We're stewards of it. And the reason for us respecting the body is that the body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, verse 19. It's even described back in verse 15, which we did not read, as a member of Christ. You see that? Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? 
That's why he gets into his argument, would you, would you take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? No. This body is not to be anywhere close to the prostitute. To take a member of Christ and do so. We're specifically commanded to honor God with the body on that basis. Yeah, I'll give you the fact that the imagery here is not exactly transparent. But the Christian's body is part of the body of Christ due to the resurrection. There is a connection. In other words, being part of the body of Christ is not just a spiritual relationship, but an organic one in some way. It's so real that it makes it unconscionable that such a human body that has been bought would be united with the body of a prostitute. Now, we understand that at death, the Spirit of God no longer indwells the body of that believer. But what had been his temple needs to be honored because if the body is a member of Christ due in part to the resurrection, then this body is still somehow united to Christ. Dr. Decker, uh, as I was studying this, this stuff, used this helpful illustration. Um, as a, a pastor that's done a lot of funerals, when a loved one in the congregation passes away, and I'll, I'll ask their spouse, you know, can I, can I borrow their Bible? You know, because I'm, I'm going through there, I'm looking to see uh, when you've got things underlined and highlighted and beaten down, the pages worn out, that's, that's some passages that are pretty precious to them, and it might become fodder for uh, the sermon at their funeral. Well, if we treasure, for example, the Bible of a loved one, sentimental though such a value may be because this was their Bible, ought we not even more to honor the body of a loved one now with the Lord? The Christian has a unique respect for the human body compared with most, if not all, of her competitors on the stage of world religions. It's only in Christian theology that you see a dignity to the body attached. That humans do have an immaterial part of their being is also crucial at this point. Christians are not materialists. Death does not end one's existence. Although the specifics of what happens to the corpse don't affect the existence of the soul, yet to be absent from the body is to be in the Lord's presence, doesn't mean you treat the body any way you want. Death has to be viewed from a holistic perspective that is one which has both material and immaterial effects on the person. Now, if you were to take your Bibles and go back to James briefly, because man can try to redefine words and phrases, but God is the one that establishes biblical realities. We are told in James 2.26... That as the body, apart from the spirit, is what? Dead. So also faith apart from works is dead. When is somebody dead? Well, when the soul and body have been separated. Biblically and theologically speaking, that is when death occurs. Neither cease to exist. You know, the body apart from the soul is, isn't functional. The soul apart from the body is also limited in some way. You know, in the words of 2 Corinthians 5, without our earthly tent house, verse 1, that is our body, Paul says we are naked. The term is gumnos, verse 3. You know, so... When, the, when this separation occurs of the body and soul, Paul says in verse 4 of 2 Corinthians 5, we are unclothed. Not only are we naked, gumnos, verse 3, but we are 
ek duo, verse 4, we're unclothed. So, yeah, in the Lord's presence immediately at death, but in a different way in His presence than when our body is glorified for eternity. Is that intermediary state. And yet in our... Um, where is I going? You know, the language reflects this uncertainty of what life will be like apart from the body. All we've experienced is our duality. We are body and soul. When Jesus, uh, going back to Jesus' example again, when His body rose from the dead, it was similar. They, they uh, recognized Jesus, but it was different than His pre-resurrection body because the post-resurrection body could pass through elements. Never seen Jesus do that before. It's going to be similar. We're going to be raised in the same way. Yet our heavenly dwelling, Paul says, will be clothed. It's an interesting usage of the word epinduomai, which likely means to put a garment on over an existing garment. You know, the, when, when Paul in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 2, says that in our heavenly dwelling, we're finally going to be clothed, no longer naked, no longer unclothed, it's put on over another. You ever, uh, during this time of year, you might have, um, I've always got a couple of shirts on. You know, and so whether it's a t-shirt or long johns, and then you put another layer on over that. That's the picture Paul's given of our glorified state, putting on over, being clothed. So in the resurrection body, it is put on over the existing earthly body, which bears some similarity but difference as well implies that the present body is not replaced or discarded, but must be resurrected for it to be clothed over. You with me? Almost? All right. Now, so let's, uh, let's th think through some... Uh, it, the New Testament authors speak of the person when he or she is buried... Well, are we talking about body or, or their immaterial part? Go to Mark 15, if you would. In uh, Mark 15, we've got Jesus' burial. Mark 15, 44. Mark 15, 44, Pilate was surprised to hear that he, speaking of Jesus, should have already died. And summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he was already dead. When he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the corpse to Joseph. And Joseph bought a linen shroud and taken him down, wrapped him in the linen shroud and laid him in a tomb that had been cut out of the rock. And he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Let's stop there for a moment. The text tells us that Pilate gave Joseph of Arimathea the body. I gave you the alliteration of the Greek term, ptoma, means corpse. You can have this body, this corpse, this dead corpse. Then Mark tells us that Joseph wrapped, not it, not that corpse, wrapped him. The personal pronoun in the Greek is auton. And placed not it, but him, auton, in the tomb. You could even expect, if you learn a little Greek, to um, expect the neuter form of that personal pronoun, Auto. Well, if Mark wanted to mean the corpse, he would have said the corpse. Auton is unambiguously masculine. In, in the Greek language, you've got to have uh, um, 
these agree with each other. So Joseph wrapped him and placed him in the tomb. Mark references, uh, refers to Jesus as a person. Though what was taken down from the cross, what was wrapped, what was placed in a tomb, was indeed the corpse. So you could speak of the corpse, the body, as him. You know, just several verses later, in the account of the women's arrival at the tomb on resurrection morning, the angel says, you're looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him, out on, Mark 16, 6. He has risen. He is not here. He says, see the place. What was laid there? What was laid in that place? Corpse. Soma. Material. But can still be referred to in personal terms. You know, as we speak unbiblically about the third member of the Trinity, and people talk about the Holy Spirit not as a person but kind of an it, or when people are trying to talk about those cells that are growing in their body, Instead of talking about that human, him or her, they talk about it. The Bible takes, talks in very personal terms. This is not just a body. This is the person. And this isn't unique to Jesus' burial account. You see this with Lazarus. Jesus addresses the dead body in the tomb, the soul is gone, and he tells Lazarus to come out in John eleven forty three. He addresses him as a person, not a corpse of a person. His soul's not there. His body is. He's still talking to him. We are body and we are soul. Again, that great theologian Murray in his book uh, or his essay, The Nature of Man, says, even in death, the body that is laid in the tomb isn't just a body. It's the body of the person. More properly, it's the, the person as respects the body. It's the person who is buried or laid in the tomb. So what is laid in the grave is still integral to the person who died. In and during death, the person is identified with the dissolved material entity. Immaterial, gone. Material still there and yet spoken of in personhood. I had... Uh, um, I, I told you about Dr. Decker, who, similar to me, for years of ministry, never had a reason to spend a lot of time studying. Is it really a big, fat, hairy deal, whether you bury or, or whether you burn? Dr. Decker brings this conclusion. He says, a biblical view of the person contrasts sharply with the materialistic views of the body which are blind to the immaterial aspects of death. In relation to the question of cremation, it's important in that many materialists view death as the end. Whatever is done to the corpse is irrelevant since the person simply ceases to exist at death and they're no longer there, so it doesn't really matter. But if, however, there is a, continu uh, a continuity between the person's body and soul in this life and in the resurrection, then it's not irrelevant how we treat the person's corpse, unquote. So for believer, burial symbolizes the promise of resurrection through anticipating the preservation of the body. Whether you go to Job 19 or, or the resurrection chapter 1 Corinthians 15, this mortal must put on immortality. We are going to change in a twinkling of an eye. Cremation symbolizes the pagan worldview of reincarnation. Now the soul has been released, purified by fire. 
Cremation better symbolizes pantheism, which in its eastern forms is usually associated with a salvation from the body escaping the cycle of reincarnation. So while believers believe in resurrection and look forward to the restoration of the body, Romans 8, 11, reincarnationists look forward to being relieved from their bodies. <laughs> Spent enough decades with that thing. Let it decay all at once, right? You know, in an age of ours that does not value the body, Christians have to capture and proclaim afresh the dignity of the human body. That's not just some cells, that's a person growing in somebody's body. You're committing murder when you abort that fetus. And even when the soul separates from the body at death and the body is laid to rest, that body is going to be what is changed to be worthy of eternity because this is mortal flesh and it has to be glorified. You know, it's, it's for the Lord. Him who was incarnate in a human body and has one forevermore, Him who became flesh and dwelt among us, ours isn't ours. It's His. Bought and paid for. It's God's dwelling. It's God's purchase. It's God's possession and to be used for His glory both in life and in death. You'll notice that you got an empty slide for resurrection, empty slide for fire as judgment. Why is this because your pastor sits around eating bonbons? No, he's having so much fun with the theology that maybe we need to stop and simmer a little bit longer on this theology, which is not on average taught in our churches. We need to bone up on it. Now, I understand that you never go to Hollywood to learn theology, but we can see the worldview of pop culture played out on the big screen. How about Tolkien's worldview written out on the pages of The Lord of the Rings? Contrasts greatly with Star Wars. There are two opposing worldviews a half a century apart. Star Wars. Now, again, uh, if you're a Star Wars fan, I'm not trying to rain on your parade. But you see the imagery. You see... The body's not really important. Yet, 50 years before was J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, presenting cremation in a negative light, not a positive one. It's the reincarnationist, George Lucas, purifying of this body to release the soul. But what about a better theology? In uh, Lord of the Rings, if you have not read these books, the most striking instance of cremation is the suicide cremation of Denethor, steward of Gondor. Not only is the event itself tragic, but Tolkien places on the lips of Denethor an explanation. As he sits by the side of his unconscious son, Faramir, whom he thinks to be fatally injured, Denethor's broken cry is this, quote, I will go now to my pyre, to my pyre, no tomb for Denethor and Faramir, no tomb, no long, slow sleep of death embalmed. We will burn like heathen kings before a ship sailed hither from the west. The west has failed. Go back and burn. You know, other than the mass cremations of carnage of war where they're all stacked up to be burned, 
There is not a positive imagery of cremation in Lord of the Rings. This is the exception. This is for the enemies. This is for the villains. Now, I don't usually go to George Lucas and J.R. Tolkien when we're talking theology. But I think it shows in our, our books or if you watch the videos, we live out our theology. We live out our worldviews. We need to have it backed up by Scripture. Uh, we need to unpack theology of the body, a theology of resurrection, a theology of how fire always save two cases in Scripture, is always in a negative light. Whether it be tongues of fire in Acts 2, or the Lord is a fire around His people, only two exceptions to all the rest of Scripture, which teaches that fire speaks of judgment. And those that have been released from hellfire, it's a horrible picture that we ought to think about as we make preparations to finish well. Lord, we thank you that scriptures give some clarity to our thinking, and Lord, we just want to honor you, and we, we understand that good men end up on different sides of the discussion, different sides of the fence. Lord, keep us from ever castigating others from having different convictional views. Give us opportunity to influence others with a biblical theology as we spend a little time in the sacred text and as we see the history of believers and the, the history of the Hebrew people and the history of Scripture, that that would enlighten these decisions that we make in time that even affect eternity. We'd be cautious to praise you in your Son's name. Amen. Now, nobody stop me. Thank you. Bill?